Hello and welcome to The Pulse. Later in this week's show, does Hong Kong need more animal vets and do they need to be trained here? And we look back at what might be considered one of Hong Kong's first cultural or trade missions to the West, the 1846 voyage of the Junk Kaying. First though, as we reported last week, concerns about the freedom and independence of Hong Kong's media continue to grow. But while the public may be increasingly dissatisfied with mainstream or traditional media, new voices are appearing. On Tuesday this week, the University of Hong Kong Public Opinion Program released its latest poll of public opinion on the condition of five core values in the SAR, namely freedom, prosperity, the rule of law, stability and democracy. The research was conducted between the 7th and the 12th of this month and involved interviewing just over a thousand Hong Kong people. According to the findings, the public perception is that all types of freedom in Hong Kong are being increasingly restricted, particularly the freedom of the media. The dissatisfaction and public concern spreads across all media. ATV and TVB's licenses will expire in 2015. The Communications Authority says it will collect public views and assess each station's performance before making recommendations on license renewal. On Monday this week, members of the public and representatives of TVB and ATV attended a consultation session on the renewal of those licenses. Once the stations had made their introductions, it was time for public responses, and they were overwhelmingly strong and critical. Most were aimed at ATV. In 2012, one episode of ATV's current affairs program, ATV Focus, drew over 42,000 public complaints that it had contained misleading content about the scholarism protest group. But there were criticisms of TVB2, as well as the lack of choice of television programs in the city at large. They 
，你點樣交代啊？無線嗰個東張西望咁樣出現咗、啊、香港電視嗰個話，即係否釋佢嘅死因，又係俾人覺得唔持平嘅。我哋要搞清楚，我哋香港人係好想要屬於香港人嘅電視台。電視台係屬於公眾利益，係為全香港人服務嘅應該。Although traditional media still dominate the market, online media is making ever greater inroads due to the popularity of smartphones and other advanced mobile technology. This mobile truck is a mobile studio station for Hong Kong Solutions on Wheels, or HKSOW. The station is using 4G mobile technology. To upload programs onto the internet as soon as it has finished recording them on the street. Vincent Wong, the station's CEO, is a former phone in program host and director of strategic planning at Commercial Radio. Vincent says he wants to develop a new way of making programs and offer the public another form of news commentary. He calls it solution journalism. I think the best way to capture Hong Kong is you actually. Move the studio around Hong Kong, rather than asking the Hong Kong people to come to the studios. That's why I think, why don't we put the studio on wheels? We want to listen to people's ideas and try to find out solutions that the public is providing to us. Ah, 政务司，啊局长，啊特首，嗱，我哋做过一个民意调查之后咧，就发现咧，雨村小学嘅居民咧，全面反对喺香港任何地方喺堆填区。咁点算咧？有冇嘢回应咧？大家唔好犹豫啦，请支持。<laughs> talking to kids is actually much more difficult than talking to senior government officials. Why?、Um, because you more or less expected what the senior government officials will say. I mean, there's something called line to take, but、um, kids they really. Talks from the hearts, and、um, they give you genuine feelings, and they also challenge you. 有一樣好中意嘅咧，就係佢真係入咗個人羣嘅裡面咯。主流傳媒咧就真係每一問一答嘅嚇，但係呢一度咧就唔係，就係多問多答。People have access to newspaper, to TV, still find they are deprived of the freedom of expression if they do not have access to the internet. And I think that's key. I mean, even mainstream media needs to think about that. I mean, if、uh, they do not have a very good online platform, they are not、um, fully utilize the freedom of expression we have in Hong Kong. I think online will be key. And、uh, given that more and more reporters feel disappointed、uh, to traditional mainstream media, they will leave their original organizations. And then where will they go? I mean. Uh, some of them will, will leave the sector completely, but some of them still love the media sector. They will stay in the media industry, and the only place they will go will be online, will be the internet. According to the government, as of July last year, there were 53 daily newspapers in Hong Kong, in various languages, both paid and free, and including one in Braille. Soon there will be one more. The Hong Kong Morning News, a newly established paid newspaper in Chinese, will be hitting the streets, according to a committee member from the publication, Guo Pingyang. Other media organisations have been speculating on its funding, with some suggesting it comes from mainland sources and that it's a subsidiary of the Oriental Press Group. Mr. Kwok declined an on-camera interview with the Pulse, but did tell us that the paper's committee has already issued a statement clarifying that their financial support is from a local source, not a mainland one. When asked whether the papers related to the Oriental Press Group, he says he can't reveal this piece of information at the moment. He also says the paper's aim is to offer readers one more credible news source. We'll be back. After the break, welcome back. Despite restrictions on keeping animals in public housing, pet keeping has become increasingly popular in Hong Kong. Pet owners concerned about the well-being of their animals welcome the fact 
that Hong Kong has more veterinary doctors per animal head than in most parts of the world. But should vets be able to train locally? Currently, Hong Kong's universities provide no training for veterinary surgeons. The SAR's qualified registered veterinarians all study veterinary medicine abroad. The City University of Hong Kong wants to change that and last year submitted a proposal to the University Grants Committee, or UGC, to seek funding support from the government for establishing Hong Kong's first school for veterinary surgeons. The request was denied. The Veterinary School Task Force of the University Grants Committee said that the current supply of general veterinary practitioners is sufficient. There are around 690 registered vets in the SAR. Also, the pets per veterinarian ratio in Hong Kong is 1,200 to 1, much lower than in other countries. But the City University Programme Director still feels we need local veterinary surgeons. We Currently, one of the strong arguments against the vet school is there is an oversupply of new graduates on the market. And while this is true, this situation is unlikely to improve in the near future because there's no controls um, regarding students training abroad um, at overseas veterinary schools. Uh, one could argue that if obviously there was a vet school in Hong Kong, a, a control could be um, inf influenced on the number of actual vet students training. There's always the danger that uh, if you get too many vets, then you stop being competitive and it becomes destructive and you get cost-cutting and the standards of the profession will actually drop. This isn't the first time that the City University has attempted to open a vet school. It made its first attempt in 2009. That too failed. Despite the new rejection, the university has decided to launch a self-funded postgraduate program this September in collaboration with Cornell University in New York. Once the post-grad programs are up and running, the university intends to apply again for funding for undergraduate programs a few years later. We'll be starting with um, research postgraduate programs leading to PhD. Uh, we'll be adding uh, taught master's programs. Those are actually much less expensive and we have uh, funding for studentships. We'll be focused on areas related to public health and in particular infectious diseases, uh, including those that can move between animals and humans. Uh, it'll also focus on food safety and on animal welfare. People often think of vets as just being um, companion animal vets, but there is a lot more scope for veterinary surgeons. And also in research, there's a huge need for further research in this region. Our Hong Kong is in a unique position um, geographically near to China where a lot of emerging disease um, in animals and humans, we call them zoonoses, diseases which will transfer for animals to humans occur and therefore public health and animal health are uniquely joined. Therefore employing more veterinary surgeons and more veterinary involvement in this topic and obviously a centre of research in the region, be it in Hong Kong or, or, or nearby, would be a very good thing for the region. Other universities are also keen to provide some veterinary training. The University of Hong Kong has agreed to collaborate with the University of Edinburgh for students to earn a biomedical science degree in Hong Kong and then a veterinary medicine and surgery degree at the University of Edinburgh. In 2010, the Polytechnic University launched a four-year honours degree in veterinary nursing with the collaboration of the Royal Veterinary College of the University of London. 
but that stopped admitting new students a year later, as it couldn't balance revenue and expenditure. Junior Whatever the type of institution, um, it's very important that it's a world-class, high-quality teaching and research is carried out there. This would benefit not just the veterinary profession, but the public at large, and also um, the region in general, including China. And now for a touch of history. In December 1846, the junk Keying, with British officers and a Chinese crew, set sail from Hong Kong. The idea was that, that it would be a kind of floating museum or exhibition hall, introducing the customs and people of China to the West. The venture did not go as smoothly as hoped. With us in the studio is Stephen Davis, author of a new book on the journey of the Keying. Stephen Davis, it's a fascinating book. Why did you decide to write it? Well, I, I actually say in the book because it's, it's one of those weird sets of coincidences. First, somebody whined on Wikipedia that the Hong Kong Maritime Museum's model of the Qi Ying, and I was museum director at the time, wasn't accurate. And I thought it was not too bad. Uh, and it, but it didn't, they said, look like the pictures. That got me looking at the pictures and realising the pictures were an absolute abortion. No vessel looks like that. So I was a bit puzzled why. And I was playing around with this idea when absolutely from left field comes an email from New Zealand from a lady called Susan Simmons saying, what did I know about the Qi Ying? What did the Hong Kong Maritime Museum know about the Qi Ying? And the honest answer had to be, well, actually not a lot. Um, we're not sure that anybody does. So she wrote back saying, well, it happens that I'm the great-great-granddaughter of Charles Kellett, who was the captain. And me and the family have been frightfully interested, and we've collected this enormous repository of cuttings from all the contemporary newspapers about the Qi Ying's voyage. Would you like them? So ever one to seize something free, I said, right on. And she sent them. And I realized that from those cuttings, I could put together the story and try to answer why it was that all the pictures were so manifestly unable to portray the vessel as it really must have looked. And is, is there anything in the, in the story which you've uh, put together w which has a contemporary uh, resonance? Um, two, p perhaps. One is the, the Tol Tolstoyan thing, that um, unhappy ships are unhappy in their individual and unique ways. And in this particular one, it's, it's a classic example of what happens when you're trying to run something distinctly Chinese as if it's something distinctly Western. And the British officers decided, you know, this is, this is a ship, we know how to run ships. We have a Chinese crew who actually knew how to run the ship a lot better than they did. Uh, and we will tell them what to do. And gradually, over the course of the months that it took to get to New York, crew relations got worse and worse and worse. And, and in New York, they fell apart. Uh, uh, in the introduction, I said I essentially that, 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 that the whole voyage was a failure. But, I mean, is, is that entirely fair? Actually, I think it is. Um, in two ways. One, I mean, you said that it was, it was a floating exhibition hall. But it was a particularly tacky one. <laughs> About four years before it, a, p a wonderful exhibition called uh, 10,000 Chinese Things was put on by an American ex-trader from Guangzhou. He'd spent 16 years in, in, in Guangzhou. And he'd taken back with him a marvelous collection of Chinese culture. And he put on this tremendous exhibition that started in Philadelphia and had been in London in 1842 and then gone traveling about the country. Um, and it has long been thought that the Qi Ying was trying to piggyback on, on that. But once you start looking at what they actually carried, which including a, a bit of the Guangzhou city walls, uh, a stuffed dog, that had died. It was the <laughs> ship's dog. It died in, in New York. So they had it stuffed and carried it along as another exhibit. And there's lots of other stuff, and it's just tacky. You know that this is not revenue. It's whatever they could pick up in a flea market. 
It, it doesn't represent China's culture in, in any way at all. And given that they almost all were, the people who invested in it, um, involved in the opium trade, one has a nasty suspicion that this has a lot to do with denigrating Chinese culture and in an indirect and backhanded way, um, justifying the mission civilisatrice of the opium wars. So, that, so there was never in itself a commercial motive for this voyage? Oh yeah, they expected to make money, um, but they just had a rotten business plan. <laughs> no, they didn't. <laughs> I mean, Douglas LePrake, who's one of Hong Kong's founding entrepreneurs, who, who put his signature to the founding of the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, the Hong Kong Wampa Dock Company, Douglas Steamship Company, he claims he never made a penny out of it uh, in, in all the time. So it they were all very young. The guys, Lane Crawford, Thomas Ash Lane, he put his money in there. Mm. And well they were all un names. under 30, and I think they just didn't, didn't get the message. Well, Stephen Davis, thank you very much indeed. And I'm afraid that's all we have time for in today's show. We'll see you at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye. <laughs>